you to worship this morning. A special word of greeting to any of you who are guests today. We are especially glad that you're here and look forward to uh, sharing in this time of worship together. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and so we begin together our uh, Lenten wilderness journey. And it is good for us to be here this day worshiping God together. I invite you to register your attendance on those connection cards that are in your order of service. We'll collect those during the offering. I'd like to also extend a word of invitation to any of you who are new to this congregation and are interested in finding out uh, more about our ministry and mission. We will be having our next welcome lunch on March 11th. This is an opportunity when uh, the staff and leaders of this congregation look forward to greeting folks who are new. So uh, that lunch takes place on March 11th at 11.15. If you'd like more information on that, you can note that on your uh, connection card. Just a couple of announcements, because I know you're going to thoroughly study those uh, uh, inserts that are included in your order of service. Uh, and that is that the tickets for the upcoming uh, Higher Ground, that's an entertainment concert, which will be held on March 2nd and 3rd, are available today. Right, Jeff? In the packet. All right. Those are uh, for the wonderful cost of zero, and uh, but it helps us uh, deal with crowd control at those concerts. So uh, pick up some tickets, pick them up for your friends, and we look forward to that time. We had a, a great uh, service opportunity a couple of weeks ago. Kim Ports is going to tell us about that. <clears throat> Back on February 9th, we got to do a Habitat for Humanity build, and it was really great. Let's see. Is it coming up? All right. There we go. So it's in the middle of Logan Heights, and it's a development for 11 families, and we got to work on a portion of it. And when we came in, that's what we were looking at. Lots of scaffolding. I was like, surely we're not going to do that. <laughs> But they're so organized and friendly. You get there and registration happens. It's all on the computer. It's quite simple. There we are, ready to start our day. We have a meeting and they tell, you break up into teams and who's going to do what and they go over safety. And here is Monica, ready to work. <laughs> I chose the, pre the uh, Playhouse team because I thought that would be really easy. Um, what I didn't know is that you have to assemble this playhouse, design it, and paint it in three hours because the family is coming to pick it up. So, it was fun. <laughs> Jean got on the last, the last team, and uh, that is always the hard work team. They had to move a fence. Here she is, moving a fence. <laughs> she was tired. And so, yeah, everybody's up on the scaffolding doing their stuff. Busy, busy. Look, we got the playhouse put together. They wanted a farm, patriotic, army theme. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's the family. They were so happy. There's one mom and five kids. The dad is deployed in Korea, and that is a family friend there to pick up the house to take it to their home in El Centro. My favorite part, of course, was lunch. We were very uh, fortunate in that Papa John's sponsored lunch for that day, so we all got yummy pizza. There we are, just enjoying the afternoon. Carl's got serious business doing on his phone there. I got to paint a horse. That was the, that was the farm animal <laughs> on the playhouse, and there is um, the finished product for the playhouse. So it's red, white, and blue. There's the army logo on the front, and there's a couple farm animals. That's the best we could do, but I really loved it. And let's see, um, Mark Stengel was up there on the way high. Who else was we got? It's hard to see. Hi! <laughs> there's the other Mark, Loomis. He was working hard. And there we go. There's Monica, she's in the middle. Mark's, Mark's day is way up at the top. There's John Carmen painting away, Kathy's sister, Amy. And that was when they finished the siding on that part. It was very exciting. So that was our adventure. It was good fun. We all had a good time. We were all very tired when it was over. And we hope to schedule another one. 
Um, it, was, it was great. So, if you are in the mood to do some physical labor, my poor husband, who did the habitat build and then is going out and doing fire recovery work at Fallbrook, he really needs someone to come help him stack wood this afternoon and tomorrow. If you are capable of stacking wood, he could use a hand. So you can get in touch with me. Thank you. And that project at Carl's doing is quite wonderful. The lilac fire yeah. up in, in Fauber. Yeah. So wonderful. Thank you to those who took part in this project, and we are so grateful that you have the opportunity uh, to serve with Habitat for Humanity. We'll look forward to more of those opportunities and stand and greet one another. <laughs>
as Noah and his family were brought safely through the flood onto dry ground, so in baptismal waters we are brought from death into new life in Christ. Jesus Christ, who is the right hand of God, forgives us and reconciles us in all things in heaven and on earth. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall be never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember this everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between us, between me and all flesh that is on the earth.
gospel lesson is from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. Our hymn is Jesus Walk the Sons of Valley, number 2112. You'll find that in the Faith We Sing hymn book. Let's stand and sing together. Sundays, we have the opportunity 
to observe this season of prayer and repentance. Well, why 40 days and 40 nights? Both of the passages read today occur in that same span of time. 40 is a biblical number that represents the time of trial before an expression of God's grace. Moses fasted on Mount Sinai for 40 days, as did Elijah. The people of Israel wandered through the desert for 40 years. But the very first 40-day story is found in Genesis, and it's a story about Noah's Ark. After the people had been as unfaithful as they could be, God caused a flood to destroy creation. And because of the people's disobedience, God showed the same deliberation in destroying, in destroying creation as God had used in creating it. So a terrible storm rained down on the whole world for 40 days and 40 nights. Now this was not a mere force of nature like flood, the kind that we're more used to. This flood in the Bible had a purpose. And God was putting an end to the violence and the vileness of the people. Now apparently God had to end what had gone bad in order to redeem it, to make it new and good again. So when that deluge was over, God then made a covenant, a promise to everyone and to everything that was left standing. And that promise was that God will never again destroy the world. Now you may have noticed in hearing the Noah's Ark story read to us today how repetitive it is. Seven times God says that he is making this covenant with his people. And it's repetitive so the hearers recognize the power of the promise. God said it seven times. Now seven is another biblical number. Do you remember the first time God said something seven times? It was at the beginning of creation. Chapter 1 in Genesis. For seven days in a row, God said it is good. And now, in the ninth chapter, God says, I will remember the covenant. And he says it seven times. So after the flood, then, a sign of God's promise is given. And the deal was that whenever God puts a rainbow in the sky, God will be reminded of that promise. Now, the idea that God needs to be reminded of things used to strike me as an odd concept. But as I get older, <laughs> I have to admit that I'm more comfortable with the idea of God needing reminders. But this reminder is not like the kind of reminders that I need so that I don't lose my keys five times a day. God is not forgetful. It's more like the kind of reminder that's like a trigger and in that way, it's sort of like the experience of being in love. When you're in love with somebody and you see something beautiful like a rainbow, it triggers something in your heart. And usually the first thing you think of is, gosh, I wish so-and-so were here to see this. The beauty and the preciousness of that rainbow reminds you of them. It reminds you of your affection for them. Well, that's the kind of reminder that God is promising. God says, when I make a rainbow over the span of the sky, I will remember you. I do this in remembrance of you. Now, another characteristic of this rainbow promise is that it's unconditional. This is not a threat. God is not saying anything like, as long as humanity behaves itself, there will be clear skies. Covenants are never conditional. They're not like contracts where each party guards their own interest. That's not a covenant. In this remarkable covenant, God says, no matter what, never again will I destroy the earth. And so this sevenfold promise shows that God accepts humanity in its brokenness and sin. And from here forward, God will offer the world the grace it needs to redeem itself over and over again. And in this way, the whole flood and covenant with Noah and creation is really the biggest baptism story there is. For after the flood, God gave new life to all of creation. So from this 40-day story in Genesis, we then go to the gospel lesson from Mark. And what do we have right off the bat? We've got Jesus' baptism. 
And just as the dove was a sign to Noah that the water had subsided, a dove alights on Jesus when he comes up out of the water. And then no sooner had Jesus dried off than the Holy Spirit cast him out into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. The story of the temptation of Jesus appears in all three of the synoptic gospels. And frankly, it's a much better story in Matthew and in Luke. It's rarely even read in Mark because it lacks the dramatic scenes of Satan tempting Jesus three times and, and Jesus overcoming that temptation by quoting scripture. But that's just not Mark. Mark was a man of few words. All Mark says is that right after the baptism, Jesus was driven out into the wilderness and he was there for 40 days. During that time, he was tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, a point that doesn't occur in Matthew and in Luke. And the angels ministered to him. In Mark, it is survival at its most basic. Jesus is in a wild wilderness where animals roam and bugs bite and sting and Satan threatens him unrelentingly. But after surviving the wilderness, Jesus knows what the beast can do. He also knows who he is and he knows who God is. I think this passage is given to us on this first Sunday in Lent as a model for how we might lead a faithful Lenten journey. I don't think it's a model for everyone, however. To go Mark's way toward Holy Week, one has to be willing to face the wild beasts within oneself. You have to be willing and ready to look at and then repent of our deepest brokenness, to confront the hurts that we hold on to and the fears that direct a lot of the choices that we make. To follow a Lenten journey like this, we need to go where the wild things are so that we can truly repent of that which separates us from God and from other people. Now this Lenten journey may sound threatening, but it is not without great benefit. The wilderness is a place of untapped potential and possibility. In the Bible, it is always the place of transformation and new life. It's where God makes new things happen. Now Mark gives us no details of what, of what those 40 days and 40 nights were like. But whatever happened out there, Jesus came out of it a changed man, transformed and ready for what lies ahead. For his first words sum up his, this, his confidence as he announces the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. I don't know what you're going to do to observe Lent, but this story in Mark calls us to do something beyond just giving up chocolate. Mark challenges us to do some hard <coughs> internal work, the kind of work that only you know needs to be done. Maybe your wilderness journey is a call to go inward and to confront some old wounds that won't heal. Maybe it's a call to strengthen a relationship with prayer. Perhaps it is a challenge to look honestly at the wild beasts of self-centeredness and jealousy and cynicism and begin to find a better way to be in relationship with those you love or those with whom you work. Wherever the wilderness journey leads you, chances are it's not going to be a comfortable and simple journey. I don't think we ought to expect it to be. Real change is rarely easy. But during Lent, I invite you to carve out some time to come into the sanctuary, to pray <clears throat> and to meditate. <clears throat> maybe it'll be just once this Lenten season, or perhaps it'll be once a week, or maybe it's even going to be once a day. Whatever you feel will help you, I invite you to come to the church to pray. You can come Tuesday nights to Vespers and then the Bible study on the Lenten scriptures, or come anytime during office hours, and we're going to have the sanctuary open. And as our theme scripture says from Hosea, I will lead you into the wilderness, and there speak to your heart. And with that invitation, I also want to say a few words about the art in the sanctuary this season. We have Rita Folsom to thank 
for equipping us for our collective wilderness journey as a congregation. Each one of these prayer flags have been made with love and careful detail and offer for us a meaningful opportunity to reflect on aspects of our relationship with God. On all of these flags, through scripture and poetry and prose, the prayer flags will serve as a first step in your personal spiritual journey. In the pews, you'll find these um, uh, flag meditation guides on the back of them are, med are reflection questions that uh, may also be helpful to you. The altar for this season represents the wilderness that Jesus dwelled in for 40 days and for 40 nights. And the passage from Hosea offers us the Lent promise that we don't go on this important Lent journey alone. Now there's one more uh, passage, one more line in this sparse passage from Mark that I don't want to overlook. And that is that when Jesus was with the wild animals, after that line it says, the angels waited on him. The angels waited on him. Jesus was never alone in the wilderness. He was cast there by the Spirit, the same Spirit that was there at his baptism. God had a hand in that transformation as well. But through it all, God's angels stayed with him. And he was therefore never alone. There's an old prayer called the Testimony of a Confederate Soldier. Legend holds it was found on the body of an unknown soldier who died in the 1860s. But I share it with you today because it describes what God can accomplish in us through our own wilderness experiences. And it goes like this. I asked God for strength that I might achieve, but I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all these things that I might enjoy life, but I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I, among all men, are most richly blessed. As we begin our wilderness journey through the season of Lent, let's remember the experience of Jesus, who was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted by Satan, was with wild animals, while angels waited on him. Amen. As we enter this 40 days of journey, wilderness journey together, let us stand together and affirm our faith. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves, and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaiming, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the Church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude, 
attitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Please be seated. Together we move now into a time of prayer, and as we do, you are invited to come and light a candle that might symbolize your prayer.
in our journey into the wilderness, may we hear your voice speaking to us and discover the joy of relationship with you that frees us to rejoice in hope. In our journey, may we discover that your spirit whispers through our tensions and struggles, moving us from brokenness to wholeness, in, through, and with Christ who is Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In response to God's affirmation of covenant with us, we give, and I invite the ushers to come and receive our tithes and offerings, please. Yeah. 